So I think we're going to kick things off. Uh, welcome everybody to today's webinar on social media and the law. My name is James Leavesley and I'm CEO of Crowd Control HQ. And today's main speaker is Steve Kunzevitz, one of the UK's leading social media lawyers and without a doubt the most exciting bio um, for any legal professional in the UK. Steve will be taking us on a journey covering off recent changes in media law and how to stay on the right side of it. Before I introduce Steve, I just want to do a little bit, few bits of housekeeping. The web bits, uh, which is Steve rattling through the subject with examples and case studies. There will be plenty of time for questions at the end, um, but please send them through uh, during the session, and we'll do our best to cover them at the end. If we, if we can't, if we don't have time for any reason to cover off uh, all these questions, then we will do a follow-up. So uh, um, rest assured that if we don't cover off your question today, you will get a response. Um, and probably more importantly, Steve's details will be made available in the follow-up email that we um, send out. Um, so, just moving briefly on, um, I'm now going to introduce Steve Kunzevitz and uh, a couple of his career highlights. So he's a partner at national law firm Slater and Gordon and is an intellectual property specialist in the area of social media. Uh, he's pretty much an authority or the UK's leading authority in this space. Uh, he's written two books on the subject, The Legal Issues of Social Media and Corporate Reputation in an Online World. Uh, both are available on Amazon and we will send links when we circulate uh, the follow-up email if anyone wants to, uh, to go and buy these books. Um, he's a couple of claims to fame. He's, he is Manchester's most followed lawyer on Twitter with over 10,000 followers. He's got almost 6,000 connections on LinkedIn and is the legal blogger for the drum. And he holds a number of board positions including ambassador for Forever Manchester a trustee at the Noise Festival and is a board mem member for the Rochdale Development Agency. So Steve, uh, this is your session, so over to you, the floor is yours. Right, thank you very much James. Good morning everyone. Uh, as usual, James makes me seem much more interesting than I am, uh, but hopefully um, I'm going to be able to live up to some of that hype, I'm going to try my best to live up to some of that hype. Um, I'm not sure anyone's really uh, an expert in social media because it's still it, it's still evolving, and that's what leads to some of the issues uh, around law and social media. In that the law, in that the ecosystem is still evolving. So if we could go to the uh, next slide, please, guys. Um, the reason it's still evolving is if you look at this, I mean, you don't really want to give this this talk to a room full of people. I ask them if they know the difference between Web 1 and Web 2. Some people stick their hand up and actually say it's now Web 5 or Web 6. Some people give me a very vacant stare. Other people run for the door. But the reason I'm talking about it is the internet and social media in particular has obviously changed quite a great deal since it first became popular in the mid-90s. And to give you an idea of where we are right now, the top of this graphic was what the web was until around the mid-90s. The web started out as a military communication system called ARPANET in the 70s. Eventually, the World Wide Web was launched by Tim Berners-Lee, a fantastically intelligent English guy. Um, and the web looked for a long time like the top of this diagram. So webmasters, people who have paid lots of money to build websites that, that uh, users read, and that was about the extent of their interaction with them. Information and opinion was um, controlled by a relatively small set of people, and all you did was read a website. Of course, if you get down to the bottom half of the screen, that's where we are now. Everybody can have an opinion, everybody can get their voice heard for better or worse, and that opinion is not always one that's had any real legal or comms or any other kind of training. You know, the, I suppose the issue is that now you can make your opinion known uh, through your smartphone, you can do it as you're walking up and down the street, smacking into people as you're looking at your iPhone, as many people tend to do. And more importantly, people can get themselves online very, very, very easily. You know, many of you will be on Facebook, many of you will be on Twitter, some of you may blog in your own right. And I go back to a quote from Orson Welles uh, that I use quite often that makes me sound clever until I tell you that I found it on the bonus features of the Star Wars Blu-rays. And that Orson Welles once said that great work was never finished, it's only ever abandoned. And 
that's particularly true on social media in that you can put content out there it will be shared and used and distorted and turned into a meme and all sorts of things done to it that you never really anticipated when you put it out there and a lot of you will be marketers a lot of you will be familiar with the phrase the wisdom of the crowd crowd isn't always wise on social media unfortunately and opinions aren't always necessarily as informed as they should be and that leads to challenges um, and the challenge that we're talking about today because we can spend a day talking about social media in the law bar and all of you have day jobs to get back to and the specific challenge that we're talking about today is social media and advertising so next slide please guys so we're now in a situation where a lot of brands, an awful lot of businesses are looking at their opportunity uh, versus their risk and as lawyers we get to grips with risk every day of the week. Uh, risk is something that we're paid to manage and thinking about how you promote your businesses on social media, it becomes a question in my mind of do you go for compliance or do you go for engagement? A lot of businesses will be tempted to go for engagement at all costs. Now engagement unfortunately on social media doesn't always go the way that you expect it to. Um, a sense of humour and a sense of taste doesn't always travel and you can look back at a number of fairly high profile incidents recently involving marketing and advertising on social media such as Carrie Fisher passing away and then Cinnamon thinking it was a great idea to have someone stick two Danish pastries onto somebody's head and use that as a viral image. That didn't go down too well. Neither did Crocs use of the David Bowie Aladdin saying lightning flash down the side of a white plastic slipper um, and again compliance can't be sacrificed for the sake of engagement because there's actually a fair bit of compliance that you do need to know about. We've done this seminar before, talked about employment law, talked about IP, talked about defamation, but if we can move on to the next slide please guys. The issue that we have here is obviously the challenge of convergence in that when we're looking to reach people, when we're looking to market goods and services, build awareness of what you guys do, um, what we have is a lot of, as, as is anything involving social media and the law, we have an awful lot of old law being kit bashed into shape to fit a new technological marketplace. And as usual, we need to go where the clients are. Um, we need to go where we're going to get engagement. And increasingly, people engage through their mobile phone. It's a, or through a smart device, through any kind of method of them getting onto the internet. And this is where people are, this is where we're going to find them most easily, it's just the customer experience that people expect these days. But of course what a lot of people don't realise is that advertising law, which people kind of take for granted as something just that just is there, also now applies to what you say on social media about your business, about how you use testimonials when you incorporate them into your own marketing messages, what people say about you, there's a fair bit of law to get your head around, it's actually relatively straightforward and some good case studies to look at, um, but what I'd also say is that behind a system that's largely built of self-regulation, there's a regulator called the Competition and Markets Authority, who as we'll see is increasingly taking action when they think that businesses fall foul of advertising law and social media. So if we can move on to the next slide please guys. So the patchwork of advertising law is a mix of regulatory and self-regulatory uh, codes of conduct, industry guidance, common law and legislation. The idea is that it's a set of rules that the industry abides by, it's largely pro-content and it's pro-consumer um, and the idea is that if the industry regulates itself then government might have to that much. So advertisers now have access to whole new sets of platforms, many of them with developing standards, again taste, humour, so on and so forth. Many of them aren't built for advertising, so we'll look at YouTube as an example a little bit further on. That was never built as an ad platform, but of course is now becoming one, as is Facebook. And a lot of the platforms and their users and their owners are now being forced to grow up in public, often under some very intense scrutiny. The issue is, of course, that we don't have one piece of legislation to point to, the one statute to rule them all. Um, but what we do have is a very good common sense guide, a great place to start, and where the majority of advertising law comes from is the Committee of Advertising Practice Code run by the ASA. Like we say, self-regulation moves more quickly than legislation, it copes well with change, at least it tries to cope well with change, and the law can never keep up with technology. Next slide, please. So the things that you need to be aware of are the consumer protection regs, the business protection for misleading marketing regulations, data protection, uh, which I'm sure will cause many of you to roll your eyes, but DPA, the data protection law is a very, very big topic now, given the changes that are coming from the EU, regardless of Brexit. The Consumer Rights Act, Privacy Regs 2003, Copyright, Trademarks, Defamation, the European Convention on Human Rights, believe it or not, the Gambling Act 2005, if you're in competitions, 
all of this feeds into advertising and marketing law in some way, shape or form. Now you don't need to be a, an expert in all of them, but this just goes to show you that there's actually quite a lot of law behind how you may choose to promote yourself or promote your businesses online. Next slide please. So the consumer protection regulations, the idea behind them is that they're meant to deal with unfair commercial practices in the internal market and there's a load of different unfair practices such as misleading actions, omissions, if you're aggressive and if you do something that's blacklisted. So there's some guidance there on what a commercial practice is, that can be just one thing that you do and a distortion is what happens when you put something out to the wider world that affects a consumer's decision or it impairs their ability to make an informed decision on something that they do. Next slide please. Um, and it is a criminal offence to breach the consumer protection from unfair trading regulations. The context of this will come in a second or two. Um, if you make a misleading statement about the existence and the nature of a product, its main characteristic, its price, and the prosecution must normally be brought within three years of the date of offence, or one year from its discovery by a prosecutor. So the point of all this is that advertising law is all based around some key areas and the biggest is that you're not misleading consumers. So this is where that imperative comes from. Next slide please. And the consumer protection regs, regs say that you uh, make a, you're involved in a misleading action if you confuse a comparison with a competitor product, you fail to comply with the code of conduct including the ASA's own code of conduct. The ASA, by the way, in case I didn't say that, is the Advertising Standards Authority, that's the self-regulator I was talking about earlier. If you provide misleading information or false information or create what's called a deceptive overall impression, you make a misleading omission when you miss out information that the consumer needs to make what they call an informed transactional decision. And you can be aggressive if you coerce or unduly influence people, that's not going to happen too often in advertising. Uh, you can be aggressive, as I said before. And in terms of blacklisted practices that the consumer protection regs says that are absolutely things that you can't do, what is most important in terms of advertising law is suggesting that you're acting as a consumer when it turns out that you're actually acting as a business. And that comes into play when we talk about brand ambassadors. Next slide please. There's the Business Protection from Misleading Marketing Regulations 2008. Um, Again, we're going to make these slides available, so I'm not going to go into that too much more, but it's all very, very similar in terms of the intent behind the regulations. Next slide, please. And the Consumer Rights Act 2015, that's a new piece of legislation that came in fairly recently that has a lot of people frantically updating their terms of service on their websites. Um, that talks about public statements to consumers about characteristics of goods, that talks about advertising and other material information provided in the run-up to sale of service, is likely to become part of a contract that you then enter into when somebody buys a product or a service. But again, this is all just sort of around the edges of some of the real issues here, but it is something that you do need to think about when you're thinking about marketing generally and certainly when you're marketing online. Next slide please. So the back of this guy's head um, is a hint to the fact that all of this legal underpinning, if you like, goes to a system of self-regulation that I referred to that is administered by the Advertising Standards Authority. Next slide please guys. The Advertising Standards Authority runs something called the CAP Code that's set out by the Committee of Advertising Practice that deals with marketing communications connected with the sale or transfer of goods or services online. And again, it's based on existing law, it's based on consumer protection law, and the idea is that it fills in gaps in legislation. As of nearly six years ago now, the ASA's CAP code, which used to apply to print advertising, screen advertising, broadcast advertising, now applies to websites and social media messages on platforms that you or your organization doesn't pay for but does control. So that's Facebook, Twitter, so on and so forth. So basically everything that you say about yourself online potentially could fall under the aegis of the CAP code unless it's in one of the exceptions such as a press release or editorial. What the CAP code worries about is that advertising needs to be decent, legal, honest and truthful and can't mislead people or potential customers about its true nature. Now the ASA has few legal powers or sanctions open to it because it's just self-regulation. What of course it can do is take a complaint and adjudicate against you and then they can publish the details of that adjudication. Um, they can refer you to the Competition and Markets Authority if you continually breach the CAP code and continually mislead consumers. But in the online space they do have some more powerful sanctions and what they can do is take out paid search results if you breach the advertising cap code and they can take out banner ads when people search for you to tell the wider world that you breached the cap code and it's important to remember that when people make a complaint to the ASA 
that content is judged on what they think you meant as opposed to what you actually meant and can be judged on the basis of one complaint alone. This can be one rogue consumer that falls out with you, complains to the ASA and potentially what the ASA can then do of course is, de is deny you further advertising space so that they can tell you not to run the campaign or the piece of content again which means that all the time and effort you've spent on getting it together and making it look right and so on and so forth, media buying space potentially when we're talking about social as well now is potentially wasted so it's important to get your head around it. Next slide please guys. So when we're thinking about user generated content, obviously engagement is great if you can get it from your, from your users and your customers and you might want to import that as a testimonial and something that you say. Certainly you need to be able to identify that as user generated content and it's important that under the, uh, the CAP code you're able to substantiate a testimonial. Please don't make them up and please do get permission to use them. You've got to have an audit trail to back up the claims that you make in your advertising copy and that other people make about you as well when you use them as a testimonial. And as I say, it's important to remember that the CAP code now covers SMS messages, emails, website text, and tweets, so on and so forth. Whilst this obviously is concerning in that people may attack you and your business online, um, a complaint under the CAP code can also be a very handy option if you take issue with something that somebody else says in their marketing materials as a competitor, for example, and you can complain to the ASA much more easily than you can potentially threaten a legal claim. There are specific rules that you need to run through, a specific procedure that you need to run through when you're making a complaint about a competitor, but it can be a very, very straightforward, fairly low cost, very easy way to potentially attack their marketing strategy. Next slide, please. Like I said before, the digital remit's been in place now for over six years, for nearly six years, and it's intended to deliver more comprehensive consumer protection online in an industry that is still going to grips with tech. Um, there's certainly been a big rise in complaints over online advertisements over the last few years, as you can see there. Um, as of 2014, when you obviously need to get some more, um, uh, we need to get some more, more up-to-date figures on that. Um, online ads at the moment make up about 30% of the ASA's workload and they've had some major wins on getting review sites to comply with advertising law, on taking copycat sites down and also in ensuring that businesses price themselves transparently online. But what we're seeing increasingly is a very blurred line between what is genuinely advertising content and what is potentially what they call native content as well. So content that looks as if it's coming from you, that looks as if it's editorial, but is actually an advert masquerading as something else. The important thing to remember is that if you're going to feed out advertising content anywhere, you need to be able to identify it as an advert, you need to label it up front, because the customer shouldn't have to play detective to figure out whether or not they're being advertised to. And transparency is absolutely key. More importantly, your audience is getting younger, tends to lie about their age when engaging, so transparency becomes even more important to that audience. And again, the ASA is taking a much more proactive stance and going after people very publicly alongside the Competition and Markets Authority, but we'll come back to them shortly. Next slide, please. The most important parts of the CAP code, if you're not familiar with it to be aware of, are certainly Rule 2, which talks about the recognition in marketing communications. It says they need to be obviously identifiable. Uh, they can't falsely claim or imply that you are acting as a consumer of purposes outside your trade, business, craft, or profession. They can't falsely claim that the marketer, again, is acting as a consumer for purposes outside its trade. You can't materially mislead, according to Section 3 of the code, or be likely to do so. And you can't mislead the consumer by either hiding the material information or by hiding material information or presenting it in an unclear, unintelligible, ambiguous or untimely manner. Next slide please. So having said all that, when engagement comes probably from or at least is seen to by marketers, engagement tends to be good and customers tend to like, like it when they're not being obviously hit over the head with an advertisement, where do we draw the line? When does content become an advertisement and when is it native content? Next slide please. So the ASA looked at this first um, nearly three years ago in an adjudication against a platform called Outbrain that lets you provide recommended links to a number of ad-funded articles for websites. It's a brand new way to get revenue uh, to media owners. It offers links to recommended articles from other companies at the bottom of normal web pages. You may have seen this in a number of different web pages that you go on to. There was a complaint to the ASA that many of these links which were adverts weren't identifiable as advertising because they were placed along other adverts with text such as you may also like this that sent you to another page. 
Outbrain, that were based outside the UK, said that their technology will let them understand how and when their users consumed pretty much any form of content, so they could then make recommendations on relevant material, and that made it kind of irrelevant in their view that some of the links were actually paid for. More importantly, the publishers retained the control over the look and feel of their content, so the content, in their opinion, was promoted rather than it being traditional advertising. The ASA looked at this and said, well, actually, saying you may like these and recommended by is not enough to identify it content as a marketing communication when it is one. Well. This is a bit of a fluid or a grey area in the UK, or at least it was at the time. Outbrain said they weren't aware of it, and they committed to working with the ASA to make these adverts much more identifiable. And it was noted in this particular case that the ruling was against Outbrain as a platform and not its users, so it took the blame. But more importantly, what tends to happen is the ASA goes after both the platform and the uh, brand or the business that makes the advert in the first place. Next slide, please. There was a really good uh, case study involving Telegraph and Michelin a few years ago. There was one complaint over a substantiation of claim that the Michelin tire always outperforms their budget comparator. Now, this was posted in a newspaper. There were lots and lots of indicators about the nature of the content in question. It was in a sponsored section, labelled as being in association with Michelin. Um, there was a statement in the first paragraph to that effect, and very heavy branding and some video content that went to it. Telegraph in this particular case had gone to Michelin, asked them for the content, they controlled the process of the filming of the video content, so on and so forth. However, Michelin did have a veto over the final copy. The consumer in question claimed this was an advert, but an eventual challenge came from not the ABA, I need to update the spelling on this, but the ASA. They asked the question, what does the average consumer think? Who is the average consumer? What they did was looked at audience demographics and drew conclusions on how savvy those consumers are. And the ASA upheld its own complaint, and it tends to complain on its own behalf very rarely. The label on the right-hand side indicated an association with Michelin, and the sponsorship in this particular instance was very ambiguous. There was financial support, but there was editorial control and veto as well. And if you just financially support a news story, then that's going to be sponsorship rather than advertising. However, if you have editorial control over the content, you have a veto of what the newspaper says, then that's a little bit different. So there was... A clear financial contribution, the right of veto was less clear, and this was not identifiable as being an advert as opposed to a sponsored content, so that was a breach, and now they say things like brought to you by, for example, but that might even not be enough in its own right. Uh, next slide, please. So going on from there, we had a um, complaint against Henkel over an advertorial for Dialon, and a fascinating piece of content. If anyone from Dialon's in the audience, then I'm sure it was very expensive and very well put together. Talking about a video headed up, which seems pretty innocuous to most people, 14 laundry fails we've all experienced. Now, this was the first time the ASA had a ruling on what they described as native advertising, which they say is paid for content by brands. So the article in this case featured a load of photos, a lot of social media posts, and a live feed from the Dialon Color Capture Facebook page. And at the foot it said, it's times like these we're thankful that Dialon Color Capture is there to save us from ourselves, you lose, little red sock. So you may think this is fairly harmless. However, on a complaint to the ASA, this is found to be not clearly identifiable as, market, as a marketing communication, as an advert. BuzzFeed responded to this as well as Behenkel, because this is where the advertorial was placed. They said that there was a lack of rulings by the ASA at the time, talking about this kind of native branded content. They then were left to rely on US guidance, and they included a... Um, a logo saying promoted by Dialon, as well as some text referring to Dialon as the brand publisher. They said, well, surely that's enough to differentiate an advertorial from an editorial, because an editorial would normally be in the name of a reporter, they'd have their photo and byline. The ASA agreed with how BuzzFeed lay these things out, with their labeling strategy for their homepage and their search listings. However, the content could be accessed from other channels, and there was no obvious clarity if they were accessed from other channels um, as to the fact that this was an advert and the more importantly, it wasn't labelled properly. In this case, this wasn't labelled clearly, and what they did do wasn't enough to make it clear that the main content of the page was an advertorial rather than editorial, and therefore it was an advert, and that the editorial content retained by the advertiser, uh, sorry, editorial control was retained by the advertiser. The page itself was very long, references in tiny type at the foot of the page, and the other labelling, such as brand publisher, simply wasn't prominent enough. So you can see this all starts out fairly harmless. This all looks as if it's something that the audience are going to be able to make their mind up over. Surely they won't be misled by this kind of thing. The government is concerned that they will be, and so is the ASA. Next slide, please. And it's important to remember that there are some exclusions to what the CAP code covers. So editorial content, press releases, no problem. Classified ads, 
again, no problem. Specialist communications to certain practitioners, we're talking about health advertising, that kind of thing, can fall outside the code. Corporate reports and natural search listings, for example, don't fall under the CAP code, or natural results on price comparison sites. And just to give you an idea of the sanctions that I was hinting at before, the ASA can't fine you, they can't send you to jail, although there are referrals to the Competition and Markets Authority in some cases that used to be rare but are actually now getting more often, and I'll come to those later. Um, they can ask advertisers to change or pull content. They can send out ad alerts to warn of content that looks as if it's in breach of the CAP code. They can ask advertisers to vet their content with the ASA before they go forward in future. And again, there are some new sanctions for the converged market for the um, for the social media market as well. There's also a microsite the ASA runs to post their own details of uh, offending online advertisers with a big focus on repeat offenders. One of the things that annoys them more than anything else is when somebody complains about something on a website or a social media feed and the business responsible simply doesn't respond to them, which in and of itself is a breach of the CAP code. And as I said before, what they can do is take out paid sponsored search links to adverts which breach the CAP code, which means you've wasted money on placing that in the first place, and have a banner ad to name and shame any advertisers that continually breach the, the, um, the CAP code's provisions. Next slide, please. But of course, what if it's not us advertising the product in question? What if we've got someone famous to do it for us in the first place? Well, this shy Italian young lady, as many of you will appreciate, is Katie Price. Katie has been involved in a number of legal cases over the years, and she was involved in the first time the ASA had a look at a social media campaign to promote a product. Next slide, please, guys. As I said before, the backstop of how brand ambassadors can be engaged and engaged properly and efficiently and more importantly, legally, complying with the role of regulation they're expected to is the consumer protection regulations. As we said before, there's a number of blacklisted activities under those regulations, including falsely claiming to or creating the impression that the trader is not acting for purposes relating to his trade, business, craft, or profession, or falsely representing oneself as a consumer. Now, celebrity endorsement these days, especially on social media, is a very big business. That's a good reason, it's if you needed one, to have a contract with your brand ambassadors and to make sure that you include a compliance clause there saying that they will pass their content through you before it goes up. They will include the relevant markers such as hashtag ad to make it clear that their tweet is part of a marketing campaign and they basically won't do anything that will get into trouble with the ASA. Now the Mars Snickers campaign back in 2012 involved Katie, as you saw in that photograph, posting, posting uh, sorry, poking her finger, I always need more coffee, uh, a photo of herself holding a Snickers bar after a day spent tweeting about Eurozone economic policy alongside in both alongside a of other people. Somebody said, I can't tell that's an advert, and actually the reveal tweet at the end of this day of um, different tweets about different subjects used the marker hashtag SPON in text had a link out to the Snickers website. What the ASA said was, well, actually, we can now tell that it's part of an advertising campaign, so can everybody else, so no problem. Of course, Wayne Rooney got into trouble in 2012 when he um, tweeted, my resolution, start the year as a champion, finish it as a champion, hashtag make it count, go Nike. Jack Wilshire did a very similar tweet, and one complaint led to an investigation by the ASA. Next slide, please, guys. Uh, what that regulation said, well, what that adjudication then led to was a debate about with Nike about whether or not people followed these ambassadors by choice, and of course they did do. What Nike also said is that people wouldn't be confused by what Rooney said and that you need to view tweets in context, and the ASA does look at tweets in context. It's a direct channel of communication, and what Nike thought was that actually people know that Jack Wilshire and Wayne Rooney have very large brand ambassador contracts in place with Nike. And the fact that we had the URL of the Nike website in the tweet made it obvious that this was part of a marketing campaign, especially when you look at other tweets which either one had sent. You can tell which are personal, you can tell which are part of a marketing campaign. What the ASA said was that actually there was no real prominent reference to Nike apart from the URL, and the URL wasn't good enough in and of itself. So not all of the followers in this case would know about endorsement deals. There's nothing in the tweet to indicate that it's part of a campaign, so they were told not to run it again. Now, Rooney got in trouble again in 2013 when he tweeted what you see there. The pitch has changed, the killing instinct doesn't own the turf at Nike football, hashtag my ground. Now, you'll notice there there's now a hashtag SPON or hashtag ad in that. Similar to the first tweet, however, 
The, re the reference to the at Nike Football Twitter handle was enough to make it clear this is part of the marketing campaign, so consumers are less likely to be confused. When you look at it in context, they look to the fact that this was different to what Rain Rooney would normally tweet. It had a staged professional photograph with it as opposed to a selfie. So when you look at it in context, this is obviously not something you would normally say. This is part of the marketing campaign. There's no suggestion that Rooney was trying to promote Nike just because he liked their stuff rather than being paid to do so. So the ASA relaxed its approach a little bit on this particular adjudication. Having said that, if you are having brand ambassadors or if you're doing any kind of social media content that's part of an advertising campaign or a marketing campaign, do put hashtag ad because what you're doing there is complying with the cat code of telling people this is part of such campaign. That might have an impact on your content and it's not fatal to admit them because as we've said here, context will tell the story. But if you don't include any kind of identifier, then you are at risk of somebody complaining about it and the ASA coming down against you, adjudicating very publicly. I'm normally ending up in the newspapers every Wednesday when they tend to run um, stories about ASA adjudications. Next slide, please. Um, there's lots of other examples about this. Uh, Keith Chegwin, where he was tweeting about Genting Golden A Casino. Again, in that particular case, if you look at that tweet, no real identification, that's part of the marketing communication. Uh, Chegwin did that himself. Uh, he wasn't paid to do so, but he did have a commercial relationship with Genting, and the tweet was linked to that relationship, so he should comply with the cap code. Tony and Guy, Gemma Collins went in to get her hair done in 2012, sent a couple of tweets talking about a 10% off promotion if you quoted the hashtag Gemma. Uh, she'd been to a salon, she'd asked if she could tweet about the great experience she had and offer a discount, so she did. There's obviously no brand ambassador agreement in place there. However, the cost of her hairdo, which you can imagine was fairly considerable, was waived, and the fact that there was a reference to the discount didn't make it clear that the tweets were marketing communications, especially when you're looking at Twitter, you're looking at someone's timeline that is fairly crowded, you can't separate marketing communications like this from the other things that they say. And what they said in this particular case, as they say elsewhere, is that using the hashtag ad certainly helps to distinguish what you're doing as part of the marketing exercise. Uh, next slide, please. Britvic in 2015, at the end of 2015, used Millie McIntosh and Made in Chelsea to post an Instagram video as part of her endorsement of the J2O brand. You can see the actual message there. Now there's the hashtag SP and the fact that she mentions at House of Yoga, at Drink J2O Sprit, you can see what they're trying to do here, trying to link it to the brand. One complaint in this case, like I said before, not obviously identifiable as an advert, and Britvic claimed that the end frame of the video was clearly branded up included their product name, their campaign hashtag. When you look at it on a mobile phone, the video display in a loop that would always include that end frame. What the ASA have done in the meantime since all of this first came into, uh, into their uh, arena was to issue some vlogging guidelines. And what those guidelines say is the rest of the cap code does is that consumers need to be able to identify content as marketing communication before they engage. And doing it at the end of the content is simply not enough. And more importantly, hashtag SP is not an identifier because SP could mean that the post is sponsored, which falls outside of the cap code. And that's a distinct category in its own right. So they were told not to run this again. Next slide, please. So, having talked about that, let's talk about influencers as opposed to just standard brand ambassadors. There's a range of them put up there, including Zoella, who now apparently lives in a very expensive house after reviewing handbags sent to her by Ted Baker and other people for a particular long time, not that I'm bitter. Um, but there are a number of examples now of the ASA stepping in and uh, making their mark on influencer marketing. So, next slide, please. At the end of 2015, uh, again, the ASA told everybody that online ads were the most complained about medium in the UK. You can see now lots of social media and petition websites are used to voice consumer discontent over ad campaigns. And again, the principle remains that you need to be able to identify an advert as an advert. It's obvious more often than not when you're being advertised on TV, on a billboard, in a publication that it's part of an advertising space. However, it's less obvious if you're looking at a digital platform where you wouldn't normally expect to be advertised to. So this came into sharp focus as a result of a case involving Mondelez or Mondelez, however you say, at the end of 2014, over five YouTube videos all featuring Oreos. So basically, Oreo and Mondelez went out to a number of YouTubers, gave them a whole stack of biscuits, some money and some brand guidelines, and told them to make some content that they could then use to hopefully go viral to promote the Oreo brand in the UK. You can see there the kind of videos that we're talking about. Every single one of these videos contained text beneath it that when you click on show more, linked out to an Oreo content somewhere on the web or the Oreo website. One BBC journalist complained about this, which then led to an adjudication. Next slide, please. 
So Mondelez said that they didn't intend to mislead anybody. They paid the vloggers, they gave them a brief, they gave them products, and they said that they needed to make it clear to the audience that they were working with Oreo. They also said that they followed standard practice on YouTube to stick up an acknowledgement to the product in the comment box, and that was enough to identify the content as an advert. The ASA said no, and they upheld the complaint in this particular instance. They said that although some of the content was clearly part of the Oreo campaign or talked about the products and talked about funding, given that YouTube content is normally editorial, normally cats falling off pianos, that kind of thing, if there's a commercial intent behind it, you need to make that clear before viewers engage with the content. Some viewers said that they understood that the content might be paid for, but this didn't show that the videos had been identified as ad content. Of course, if it's sponsored editorial, then the vlogger has control over that, or that the audience would have identified as advert before they engage with it. And the presentation of each advert was in keeping with the standard content that you see on those channels. It wasn't immediately clear that this part of the marketing communication, the production example, um, and saying thanks to Oreo for making this possible is not a get out of jail free card, is not enough of a disclosure statement to tell people this is part of an advertising campaign. The viewers may have known that Oreo was involved in the production of the content, but they didn't necessarily know that money had changed hands and that Mondelez had control over the content itself. Next slide, please. So. Some of the videos referred to Oreo having asked these people to carry out the lick race or the the um, stunt in question, but that wasn't enough because it didn't say how involved they were in the content. And the early references to Oreo in some of the content, again, weren't enough. There was no clarification. Some of the videos had a disclosure statement at the end of the video or in the text description, which you then have to open or click on to understand that this is part of the campaign. But even if this was enough, putting that at the end of the video meant that you couldn't have made it clear that this was part of the marketing campaign because the consumer had already engaged with that content. So the videos didn't really set out the full commercial intent behind them. They didn't make the disclosure before people engage with them. You couldn't tell they were adverts, so they were in breach of the CAP code. They weren't identifiable. Again, there was a 2015 um, guidance coming out of the ASA for this, talking about making ads clear. And it says, and it's true to this day, that vlogs become adverse as a result of payment and control. You need to make both clear up front, especially if it's on a channel like YouTube where you wouldn't normally expect to see advertising copy. There's nothing wrong with vlogging for money. It's perfectly legitimate, but the onus is on both the advertiser and the influencer to be upfront about that money having changed hands and disclose that relationship. Vloggers tend to build fan bases on their originality and their authenticity, and it could damage both sides if you try and hide that payment or hide that control. And bear in mind, it's also going to potentially be a breach of the consumer protection regs. Next slide, please. Um, not long after that, there was a complaint uh, against a uh, platform called, uh, well, I just throw on the ISBA slide here. Again, they were talking about welcoming that particular ruling about whether or not vloggers seem like less of a safe bet for brands. However, I don't think anybody thinks that that's the case and influencer marketing is only going to grow and grow and grow. Uh, but what we did have was another adjudication back in May 2015 against a channel on YouTube called Beauty Recommended from Procter & Gamble. Next slide, please. Uh, that was from a style blogger who um, complained about, again, a fairly innocuous looking video, easy lit makeup tutorials for winter time. Now, the vlogger in this particular case talked about and used Procter & Gamble Max Factor products amongst some other brands. And at the start of the clip, there was a statement saying, sponsored by Beauty Recommended, brought to you by Procter & Gamble. That listed all six Max Factor products featured. It linked out to the Max Factor online shop. Procter & Gamble said that it was obvious that this was sponsored from the start of the clip before people engaged with the material. And what they also said was that Beauty Recommended was a brand in its own right, that consumers would know that this was part of a campaign. The ASA said, well, no, they actually wouldn't. They wouldn't know that Procter & Gamble owned Beauty Recommended from this link to the Max Factor brands. And the channel page itself, when you landed on it, didn't suggest that it was sponsored either generally or there was no indication of sponsorship or being an advertisement in any of the individual video titles. No explanation of the fact that this all came from Max Factor. Next slide, please. Uh, not long after that, we had, at uh, the end of August 2016, an adjudication against Carlsberg over a video headed England versus Netherlands vlog, international friendly, hashtag app. That was a joint promotion with Carlsberg where you could win tickets to England versus Russia at Euro 2016. Um, there was a guy called Spencer FC who um, wants to attend the England Friendly at Wembley. The text underneath the ad said, to enter England versus Russia tickets giveaway, retweet this tweet and follow at carlsberg.uk. Uh, one complaint, Spencer FC's channel was popular with people under 18, so the, the allegation was the advert was inappropriately targeted, just as if you would say you shouldn't advertise um, alcohol on kids TV channels, it's all about scheduling and targeting. Carlsberg said that this video wasn't directed at under 18s, either through its selection or the platform or the content itself. Next slide, please. Uh, 
And what saved them in this particular case was the fact that they had a lot of data to back up that claim. The core demographic of Spencer FC's channel was football fans between 18 and 40, 85% of them over 18. That figure was consistent over time based on users that logged into YouTube. And the demographic data from other sim similar football channels also backed this up. So less than 25% of the channel's audience is under 18. That requirement complied with the cap codes rule 18 there wasn't anything irresponsible in the video it didn't suggest that you should go out and drink a lot of beer the focus was on the tournament and there was no exploitation of either youths or the vulnerable viewers so both spencer and his brother appeared both of them are over and more importantly look over 25 then they took great care here to avoid appealing to under 18 in the content so there was no breach largely based on having data to back up claims care taken in the presentation of the content and the fact that it didn't appeal to under 18s and reliance on dialogue so go on to the next page please think about how far you can go well uh, when you're dealing with influencers again viewers consumers need to know it's an ad before they click on it a message in the comments box or in the video isn't enough you've got to include it in the title more often than not certainly uh, whoever features needs to acknowledge the partnership verbally again nothing ott but it certainly has to be mentioned do use a get out of channel hashtags, hashtag ad, especially when you're sharing on one channel and then it can be shared somewhere else so that if anybody else links to it, they know they're going to an advert. The look and feel needs to be distinct. If it's different to usual editorial content, that it's going to be easily more identifiable as an advert. And remember that these are UK guidelines in an international environment. The US guidelines from the FTC are a lot tougher. So I would say, do you want to build a stronger unpaid relationship with an influencer to avoid the problem? Is it more authentic if they really like your product? What's long term? and worth of a vlogger, lots of different things to think about there. Uh, next slide please guys. And the ASA says that the use of vlogs commissioned or produced in collaboration with a third party is going to fall under the cap code, but your context and the sharing by the brand should also identify it as a marketing communication. They say that the hashtag ad isn't always necessary, but I'd say it's usually advisable. However, if it's similar to what they normally feed out when they're not paid to do it, then payment is made and it's published by the vlogger, then it becomes an advertorial and does fall under the cap code. So again, rule two obliges marketers to make it clear that content is an advert that must be labeled upfront before people consume it by the vlogger and identifiers again help to separate that content out from what they would normally say. Certainly don't use sponsored by or funded by because that involves confusion over the control of the content and their intent and using identifiers in the comment box may well not be enough. So I'd say normally put it into the title of the content itself. Uh, you can have product placement and editorial content, but you do need to identify if you have supplied someone with props, for example, and samples. Again, sponsorship, pure sponsorship, falls outside the cap code. We'll come back to that shortly. And items provided for free by brands to vloggers without control over their content also falls outside the cap code. But it's worth acknowledging that you've sent it to them, and it's worth the influencer acknowledging that they've received it just for the sake of clarity. Next slide, please. So that gives you a rough outline of landscape. In terms of what's coming next, there are a number of things to think about. Next slide, please, guys. Certainly online reviews in the US, Amazon is taking action against a number of fake reviews in their marketplace and astroturfing products is a lot easier to do online and in social media where the lines are a little bit blurred. Lots of benefits from having people say nice things about you in their own right helps consumers make better, faster, more confident decisions. But what the government is worried about is that some of these reviews may be fake and those decisions aren't going to be as informed as you think. What they're trying to do is encourage new businesses to improve the quality of their goods and services and of course online reviews help new businesses to make their brand and make their purpose known online. However, some of what people and businesses do online when they look to promote themselves, when they look to promote themselves through positive reviews may mislead uh, consumers, may reach the consumer protection regs. Certainly the posting of fake reviews does that or the non-public of negative reviews and there's been lots of action taken by the ASA against review sites fairly recently and when businesses pay review sites for endorsement in a light space without any clarity on the fact that they've done so. So the government did a very wide range of review of a number of review sites, forums, social networks. There was a massive range of credibility from some specialist sites, TripAdvisor, which seemed pretty credible and started to get their act together. Trusted trading schemes like check trade booking agents such as booking.com and there's a big difference between open systems where anybody can review and a closed system where only a confirmed purchaser can review, which is certainly one of the more popular options these days. How they make money tends to depend upon the nature of what they do. Free sites which are ad-funded to reputation management platforms just go to show you that there's a massive swathe of different ways of doing this. And some of the reputation management platforms that take payment to get rid of bad reviews are certainly right in the crosshairs of the CMA at the moment. What the government said was that 
54% of UK adults read online reviews in 2015, with up to 80% of people believing that they were genuine and most of them being happy with what they buy. Next slide, please. So talking about, again, when something is identifiable as an ad, when it is actually an ad, we go back a few years now to an enforcement action taken to handpick media that was an agency engaged with some bloggers on behalf of one of their clients to promote, I think it was a video of some hoodies uh, on a skateboard park. Um, it turned out that they were actually agency staff and this was a potential breach of the consumer protection regs because there was a non-disclosure of material information and this was found to be an unfair commercial practice. However, handpicked, engaged constructively with, with the um, with what was then the Office of Fair Trading, they ran a blogging network and they gave undertakings or promises that they basically wouldn't do it again. They wouldn't falsely create, create the impression that they were acting as consumers when they were doing it as part of what they did for their, um, their business. Um, interestingly, in March 2016, a business called Total SEO and Marketing was asked to give undertakings as to future conduct again because they posted 800 that's 800 positive reviews over a year for 86 businesses across 15 different websites, all of which were found to be fake. So they had to give an undertaking to the um, CMA that they wouldn't post any further fake reviews, they had to remove existing posts, and the CMA then wrote to all of Total SEO's clients to warn them that fake reviews might lead to them breaking the law as well as the agency, and the CMA put out some useful guidance on what to do about online reviews. Next, uh, next slide, please. Now this talks about the ASA looking at vetted limited and checkandtrade.com and talked about what you need to do if you're a review site, the uh, clarity of the procedures that you need to run, the fact that you need to have an obvious dispute resolution procedure if someone disputes a review, if a trader disputes a review for example. Um, I'm not going to go into that into too much detail but certainly if you're going to run a review site you need to be very stringent and have very very good procedures in place to convince people that actually what you're doing is kosher and that the reviews are genuine. The ASA expects you to be transparent. Next slide please. Uh, again, the CMA uh, got involved in this particular case uh, rather than the SA as the regulator, as I said, they're getting much more active as you can see in the uh, slew of different um, adjudications here. Uh, they engage with tradespeople, check a trade, trust a trader, carehome.co.uk, uh, care opinion, most recommended care. They work with the CMA to review their practice and making improvements in response to a number of specific concerns and what they agreed to do was to make sure that all genuine relevant and lawful reviews were published with no right to restrict them rather than restricting publication or request and indicating that restriction to users. They ensured that all reviews would be checked to ensure they're genuine and they ensured that important information on that review process and practices would be brought to the attention of users as well as ensuring a disclosure of all commercial relationships with businesses that advertised on their sites. So there is a call for evidence and clarity in consumer terms and conditions and there may be a new regime planned in the not too distant future for civil fines for this kind of thing. Next slide please. What the CMA says that if you're thinking about uh, online reviews, if you're running a review site, you need to promptly publish your reviews, make sure they're genuine, make sure they're lawful, have checks in place to ensure that they're verified, both positive and negatives, have a review policy, explain that process to users, don't game the system by dissuading reviews, don't only collect them for satisfied customers, don't offer incentives. If there is a commercial relationship with the business, then tell people about it. Negative reviews aren't necessarily complaints or not for publication and you need to, as ever, label any advertising clearly as advertising and identify it. You've also got to have a process in place to remove fake reviews and paid promotions still need to be identified. And more importantly, your staff and your clients need to be trained along with the review of your client contracts. Bloggers and outreach, again, need to involve strict instructions to label their paid content and any approach from clients who try to avoid that disclosure you need to reject. More importantly, what the CMA also says is that clients are responsible for compliance here as much as the agencies themselves. Next slide, please. Um, at the end of August, or the beginning of August last year, a local business in Manchester called Social Chain was investigated by the Competition and Markets Authority because what they did was use different social media accounts which they build and then get followers for. They arranged for a number of widely followed personalities to promote films, games, takeaways, dating apps without telling their audience that this was part of a paid content initiative, this is part of the marketing campaign. Between March and July 2015, Social Chain ran 19 different campaigns involving undeclared social advertising in the view of the CMA with a reach of over 4 million followers and they helped the campaigns to trend on Twitter. That only helped to build reach and build readership. Social Chain accepted that YouTube, Twitter and the Instagram adverts in this particular case may have been difficult for readers to distinguish from other posts, which is the whole point. They appeared alongside other posts, conversations and jokes and again, their context is key. In this particular case, they went out of 
of context, but they weren't identifiable as adverts either. So again, social chain agreed to undertakings, all further advertising will be clearly labeled and distinguishable from other social media content which they ran. Uh, and the CMA, again, wrote to 15 social chains clients and 43 personalities who published content for them, warning them that arranging advertising that's not clearly labeled may be a breach of the consumer protection regs. Uh, uh, next slide, please. So again, there's some useful quotes in the essay here about social media personalities and their influence on people's views, especially young people, and the growing importance of online views and opinions because they're an increasingly useful source of information when people make buying choices. So it's increasingly important that reviews, that recommendations need to be genuine. And again, if you want to have a look at it, the CMA uh, Open Letters to Marketing Agencies has got some really good and useful guidance into it. Uh, next slide please. Um, there's one here about ad targeting by social media that is a little bit techy so we're going to squeeze past that if we can do to some of the most important stuff that I think comes out of this. Uh, next slide please guys. About when you should use hashtag spawn and hashtag ad. This is coming from the end of October last year. The essay said that there's a general rise in complaints as we talked about of social media content not being identifiable as advertising. Most complaints resolved informally. So bloggers, bloggers, new sites tend to play ball with the ASA. However, there have been what the ASA refers to as misunderstandings about when identifiers should and shouldn't be used. So advertorial in the ASA's opinion is content in an editorial space that's paid for and subject as we said before to a degree of editorial control by the relevant brand. Giving a favorite blogger a freebie is going to be an ad as is having them take part in an event or experience on the prerequisite of giving them a positive review. So if you give something to get a good review then that becomes part of the marketing campaign. There was an adjudication against Alpro where they in September last year were involved with a TV presenter's Twitter screen that said fave summer snack vibes, you can see the tweet there. That wasn't identifiable as an ad or editorial and it was upheld because it didn't have the hashtag ad identifier and there was a paid ambassador agreement in place in this particular circumstance. Um, sponsorship happens where you make payment but the editorial control over the content remains wholly with the creator. That's not an ad for the purpose of the cap code and the lending a computer for the purposes of an honest review is not going to be an, honest, it's not going to be an advert for example nor is putting some money behind a series of news articles that people want to read without having any editorial put over them. And what the ASA says is the onus of identifying content as an advert is on the publisher and the influencer as well as the brand. Sometimes content, context rather, may make the difference, it's certainly if you don't have a specific label, but ad or advertisement feature is always recommended as an identifier. Sponsorship in and of itself isn't advertising and more importantly if you're advertising you can't be sponsoring in the ASA's view, so please don't use hashtag spawn as this may mislead people that, to think that it's not part of an ad campaign, that it's actually sponsored and brought to you by or in partnership with in the ASA's view are just too ambiguous. So if you're going to label anything as an advert, label it hashtag ad. Next slide please. So having said all that, and some of you will never go anywhere near social media ever again, that's not the point of all this, the opportunity does outweigh the risk, but that opportunity needs to be balanced against the legislative and the regulatory framework that you do need to be aware of. Social media may seem like the Wild West, but it isn't, and as you've seen hopefully through this, um, this discussion, um, there's an awful lot of risk and there's an awful lot of potential traps for the unwary in terms of regulation and it's very easy to make a complaint and it leads to a very public bloody nose for your brand so getting it right and mastering uh, and harnessing that opportunity and doing it the right way is only going to help you in the long run. Uh, next slide please. Uh, that's an awful lot of content. I've talked very fast, I'm aware of that, I drink a lot of coffee. Uh, we've left some time for questions. Does anybody have any apart from why should I ever tweet ever again? Steve, thank you very much for that uh, whistle-stop tour. Uh, I'm not even going to bother trying to summarise um, <laughs> those 50 slides in uh, within a couple of minutes, but um, uh, we've had a whole heap of questions in, so we're going to try and cover off uh, as many as we can. So the first one is, um, does there need to be a commercial agreement in place if a celebrity is promoting or referencing your product? Uh, I would say that it's a very good idea. 
mainly because if you've got an agreement in place, there can be a clause in there that gives them an approval process for the content that they feed out, say, if they're working with an agency, for example, if they're working with you, if there's something in something that they've signed to say, put hashtag ad in everything that you do, then at least that gives you some fallback. That, of course, doesn't get you out of trouble if the ASA does come after you. Um, but, yeah, if there is a commercial intent behind it, if money has changed hands, then I think you want to exert as much control as you can over how they then promote your brand. And these agreements aren't the most expensive or complex thing in the world to draft. I'd say it's just part of due diligence, to be honest with you. Okay, so, so, so thanks for that, Steve. In a similar vein, um, if an organization's brand ambassador was to, to share some information, a photo about a product or a service, on Twitter without being asked, does it have to be labelled hashtag ad? Uh, I would say yes, because there's still a relationship behind the sharing of that content. If you know, it might well be that they've done it out of the goodness of their heart, they're required to do, I don't know, say 10 tweets over a month and they've done 15. But if they're doing it and if there is a commercial intent behind it, then I would say yes, because they're not doing it as a consumer necessarily, they're doing it as part of their trade or profession because there is an agreement in place. Okay, um, so moving into, because obviously you know, a lot of organisations, well, both commercial and public sector organisations are um, heavy users of social media. So do you have any advice for public sector organisations who are trying to influence the views or behaviours of their audience? You know, if they're promoting public information, you know, do they have to have hashtag ad included within their content? Well, I think that's a little bit different because you may then be verging into areas of editorial, I think, rather than promotion of a product or service. Um, that's a whole different set of communications and you obviously will market that kind of thing very, very differently anyway. But if it's not something that promotes a particular set of goods or services, then it doesn't necessarily fall under the CAP code anyway. And I think there's a whole different set of communications in terms of building engagement around social care, around the activities of accounts or whatever. I mean, you, you, the, the easy answer is to say, well, just stick hashtag ad on absolutely everything. But that's what the... Um, that's what the exceptions are there for. And I think that's a very, very distinct kind of social media engagement to me. The risk in that is much more ensuring that nobody says anything stupid as opposed to you not being able to identify something as an advert. But there are examples, say, of local councils where they run campaigns. I think there was one a few years ago where a local council ran campaigns about the number of immigrants in the area or something like that that was actually found to be offensive. Under the uh, under the cap code, so I don't think they're worried about masquerading as there being a, a, a commercial intent where there isn't. What they're more worried about there is the content of the advert itself. And if you've got advocates within uh, these uh, these um, bodies that are tweeting on behalf of of the uh, the organisation, then having a decent social media policy in place and using a software solution that uh, sorry hint to crowd control, um, using a software solution that is going to who, um, is going to help you have some control over that is time very, very, very well spent. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and thanks for the plug there, Steve, as well. <laughs> so in, in, terms well. Of user, in terms of user-generated content, um, you know, obviously you know, uh, a lot of organisations are trying to uh, you know, provide great service, great products, and, you know, and, and users out there are writing positive tweets about you know, organizations, products and services. You know, are there any implications for just for retweeting this? I don't think retweeting it's an issue because I think you've got to you've got to remember that when people sign up to use these services, then you they are um, they're abiding by their own T's and C's. So retweeting is envisioned as something that will happen on the platform anyway, but certainly if it then comes into your own Twitter feed, I think there's there's a fair bit of due diligence to be done just to make sure that you know this is this is genuine. You can't have an audit trail for absolutely every tweet, for example, but I, think, I do think there probably needs to be a little bit of care in what you what you do retweet. Just think about and, and this goes for all kinds of social media really. Think about the view that you're retweeting. You know, if you get 
a, uh, a retweet from someone in the Philippines and you're a local, local council, is it going to be relevant to your marketing strategy anyway? So again, just be aware of who you're dealing with and be satisfied that it is genuine as much as you can do. But there's a difference between retweeting it and then taking it out of that ecosystem and then using it as part of a wider marketing campaign. That kind of thing you would normally need to ask permission for. And I don't think it's any bad thing to say, send a direct message to the user on Twitter if you can do, or get in touch and say, thanks very much for this. We'd like to use this as a testimonial. Do you have a problem with it? More often than not, I can only imagine that they would be very happy for that to be the case if they've said something good about you. Okay. The, I mean, <clears throat> you know, again, a lot of organisations are using a lot of social media accounts, um, and there's a lot of people involved in the in the execution of that social media. <clears throat> so how, you know, whose ultimately ultimate responsibility is it within the organisation to make sure that potentially misleading statements or content is sent out on behalf of the organisation's accounts? Well, that, that's a very interesting question because if we're talking about a social media policy, um, the same way as you would have an IT policy, for example, there's there's a quite a healthy debate about whether or not responsibility for administering that sits with the IT and the comms team or whether it sits with HR. In my experience, it's a bit of a balance between the two because if a social media policy works really well, it has um, stuff in there about you know, if you do this, you will end up disciplined or potentially fired. But it should also have best practice guidance in there as well. And what you should try and do to the best of your ability is equip people that you want to go out into the wider world and tweet on your behalf. I think you're going back to one of the few real experts in social media, Brian Solis, talks about the conversation that's happening without you. Just because you're not part of this conversation doesn't mean that it's not going on. And there will be people talking about you and your business, whether you like it or not. And the best you can do to try and build, I think, a positive buzz about around what you do and to equip your staff properly is to pick your, you know, your stars, if you like, internally, train them properly, monitor them regularly, feed them out um, messages that you want to get out to the wider world, explain to them what their tone of voice needs to be like with their out promoting your brand and your business because that in itself can be a problem as well. I think you know, it needs to be a top-down, well-thought-out process if you're going to get the best out of it and I think it needs to be a good balance between the comms team, between IT and between HR. Okay, and, and I think obviously you, we, you know, there is in, depending on which industry you're in, certain industries such as the um, uh, automotive or financial services are ruled by uh, the FCA. Um, where actually both the organisation and a senior manager are responsible for for any breaches, um, you know, with the with the cap code, is there any sort of personal liability falling on senior managers? Well, not necessarily, no. But I think the, you raise a great point about the FCA in that the FCA has taken a while to get their head around social media and they have they have put guidance out I think from, from the FCA perspective what people and businesses need to remember is that if you say you retweet a non-compliant social media post that doesn't include the usual disclaimers that you'd expect from an FCA regulated advert then you take on the compliance burden and the risk of having shared that message and what the FCA expects from you in particular is to make sure that you have an audit trail for every single claim you make on social media so I think the tolerance of risk and the approach to how you deal with that risk especially around thinking about the, the cap code is one thing but where you have specific industry regulation I mean lawyers do but very few people realize that um, that says what you can and can't do on social media then that needs to be your first starting point. You know, if you're restricted by professional obligations and what you can say and how you can say it, then that again needs to feed into your social media policy and say, oh, but what we might tell you, this is what the regulations say. So that we've yet to see, I think, a case where this has gone spectacularly wrong. I think we've yet to see any enforcement action by, for example, the FCA. But if you're in a regulated sector, then managing that risk and using tools to see what the sentiment is around you around what people are saying about it what people are saying about your brand internally is is just completely essential I'd say it's essential for everybody but I would do but there's there's a different imperative when you're in those kind of businesses I think yeah thanks Stephen and I, and I think you know we see a lot of organizations especially in the automotive um, space 
um, by, buying our software to, to ensure that there is that level of compliance but, but at the same time it's actually good governance for all organizations to make sure that there are full audit trails in place, there is a sign off process, you know, whether it's either by exception um, or, or for all content. Um, just, uh, just a final question just to wrap things up really, which is how do people keep up on the changes to advertising law? A great place to start is the ASA website. The ASA website is an absolute treasure trove of information and if you sign up to be on their mailing list, they'll send you uh, hot topic briefings, they'll send you every week you will get a, um, uh, a digest of all the most recent uh, adjudications. Great, great place to start. Um, but I think if you want to, you know, if if this concerns you, if this is something that you do want to keep uh, keep a closer eye on, you know, there's Google Alerts, there's any number of ways to do it. But the ASA website is in admirably clear English and has some really really good guidance notes on it, and I'd say that's that's a great place to start. But talking about you know the, um, I would try to think, there's a number of marketing industry bodies that again give you lots of really handy guidance about this kind of thing. Okay, great. Well, um, unfortunately, we've run out of time now, so uh, we haven't managed to answer all questions. So apologies for those that have sent them in but um, haven't received an answer. We we will make sure that these are all collated. Um, get back to Steve, um, and then we can put some uh, responses together and, and make sure that those are circulated. Um, just a big thank you to the audience for their participation today. And a big thank you for Steve um, sharing his knowledge and wisdom on the subject. Um, there no. will be. Go on, Steve. Sorry. No, that, again, just to echo what James said. You know, it's uh, it, it's been a pleasure to hopefully um, shed some light on what's a complicated area. And um, certainly, if anybody does have any questions, then do feed them back, and we'll we'll certainly do our best to answer them. Uh, and just as a, a final wrap up. Um, the slides and the audio uh, of this uh, today's session will be sent out via email um, after the event, uh, maybe in the next kind of couple of days. So uh, you can all then have a copy. So again, thanks very much. And we will be running a series of other sessions on different subjects uh, over the coming months. So uh, we'll keep you updated on that. So thanks very much for your time. <laughs>